It's July 28th, 2014. We're in Atlanta, Georgia, in the home of Ambassador Andy Young to continue a conversation we started uh, earlier, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and we want to get back to where we were and talk to you, if you will. Well, it's been 50 years since the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voters' Rights Act. Are we today where you wanted us to be? Well, I think uh, in some ways we are way ahead of where any of us thought we would be. Um, we started out to redeem the soul of America from the triple evils of racism, war, and poverty. Now, in 1955-1960, there was a general consensus uh, coming out of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, that the role of government was to see that every American uh, had the maximum amount of opportunity and freedom to express themselves, to educate themselves, to uh, be given an opportunity to have access to freedom, uh, which was democracy, uh, and access to capital, which was capitalism. Now, the problem was we didn't say that. We sort of took it for granted. And after Dr. King's death, in fact, Dr. King's death occurred essentially when he reached the point where we had to deal with the questions of poverty. It was not, in fact, I remember him making the transition uh, from race to war because he said things like the, drums, the bombs we drop on Vietnam will explode at home in inflation and unemployment. And he saw the connection between uh, economic success globally and, uh, and the war. Mm -hmm. Is that bothering you very much? Okay. Your role, of course, in the civil rights movement cannot be minimized. Let's go back to the very let beginning. Me, let me just kind of finish that. I was worried about that. I don't know where that phone call is, <laughs> phone is coming from, but uh, the um, when he turned toward the question of poverty, uh, he was requiring, well, he was challenging uh, the economic reform of our government. Now, he always related that to in fact, he, at the March on Washington, he related it to America had presented the Negro with a bad check. Mm -hmm. So in his mind, political freedom and the right to vote and economic freedom and the right to a job were inextricably bound together. Mm -hmm. and, and yet we didn't talk much about anything but the right to vote and also uh, breaking down the as the book of Ephesians says, the, the dividing wall of hostility between black and white. Uh, in the Bible, it was between Jew and Greek. Uh, in, in our time, we saw that same dividing wall of hostility as being between black and white. And I think we have successfully broken that wall down. Mm -hmm. um, but when it came time to pay off that check. <laughs> I mean, it, going way back to slavery, um, the largest asset in the nation at the time of the Civil War was slavery. Uh, the railroads were next and they were de evaluated at 
worth $2.5 billion. Um, the estimated value of slavery was $4 billion. And so we have never looked at slavery and freedom economically. Uh, we just sort of write all of that off. Now that wasn't the way it was at the end of the Civil War. Um, there, was a there was a call for a Freedmen's Bank, uh, and which was established. Uh, there was uh, a promise of land. Uh, we saw recently on Georgia Public Broadcast that uh, when a group of preachers got together with Sherman down in Savannah and he asked what they wanted, they said land and access to a mule and that's sort of where the 40 acres and a mule came from. Uh, none of that happened. Uh, and. Um, so that we have, we have never really fully faced up to the economic consequences of poverty. And that's black, white, brown, Asian, um, mm -hmm. Hispanic, Native American. Uh, and those were the questions that Dr. King began to raise or planned to raise on the Poor People's Campaign when he was shot. Mm -hmm. And we never got back to him. In fact, it almost seems as though we forgot them. Mm -hmm. And um, that wasn't accidental. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um, but I happened to go to Congress um, four years after Dr. King was killed. And I was on the banking committee because we were building a mass transit system here in Atlanta. And uh, urban affairs and mass transit were all under banking. Uh, and so I ended up in a meeting where the Nixon administration put an end to the Bretton Woods Agreement. Now, I frankly, I'm a preacher. <laughs> I majored in biology in college uh, and uh, studied politics on my own, but I didn't have a clue about economics. So I leaned over and asked, Ed Koch was my neighbor <laughs> on the banking field. I said, what's the Bretton Woods Agreement? He didn't know, he leaned over and asked the next guy, and he didn't know it, he leaned over and asked. So nobody really knew what was going on. But I, lo I learned later that the Bretton Woods agreements were the agreements that we made in 1944 at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, where everybody's currency was tied to the dollar, and the dollar was tied to gold. And we did that in 1944. And that was what stabilized the economy of the world. So that Europe had a chance to recover, Japan had a chance to recover, but also uh, places like South Africa and Brazil and Mexico and uh, North Africa. Uh, everybody was growing at a pretty stable uh, rate pretty much the same. So the whole world was prospering. In, uh, that was toward the end of 1973 when uh, Arthur Burns, George Shultz, who was, Arthur Burns was head of the Federal Reserve, George Shultz was Secretary of Treasury, and Paul Volcker was the Assistant Secretary of Treasury for Monetary Affairs, and they came and testified that they thought the United States should end this agreement. And nobody said anything. And I didn't know what was going on, and I remember saying, but if the dollar is not tied to something, aren't people going to play politics with our currency? And Arthur Burns took a puff on his pipe and said, young man, you'll soon learn 
that the dollar does not need you to defend it. <laughs> so, well, that was, that shut me up. <laughs> you, you couldn't talk back to Arthur Burns, uh, <laughs> not me anyway. And, uh, but nobody else on the banking committee raised a question. The thing was that at that time, the price of oil was $2.50 a barrel. In six months, it was almost $20 a barrel. By 10 months, it was $60 a barrel. And it's been up as high as $160 a barrel. So that it seemed to me that we went off the, the gold standard where everybody's currency was related to the dollar and the dollar was related to gold. And we went on this roller coaster of oil pricing that traded the economic stability of the whole planet for the wealth of a few. And I think that's the origin of our present troubles. The only thing is, we never talked about it. And Nixon's impeachment started within a couple of weeks. And I almost think that it would have been better if we'd never heard of Watergate and we'd focused on what is the implication of this economic change. Now what makes it worse is that exactly 25 years later, Paul Volcker wrote a book with the Japanese foreign minister, a uh, Japanese finance minister, called Changing Fortunes. And in 25 years, the premier role of the U.S. had flipped, and now Japan was the big dog. And Japan was controlling the global economy temporarily. Uh, fortunately, we've recovered from that. But so much happened during that period behind the scenes that destabilized the whole world economy, that we have not been able to help not only the black poor, uh, we've not been able to, we have had a widening gap of inequality. Um, and the best way to put, for me to define what that means to the average citizen is that when I got married, uh, and I think in 1960, I got married in 54, 1960, my wife got her master's degree uh, in education from Queens College, and it cost us $16 a quarter. <laughs> you know, and now that was, that was the economics of that time. Smart people could get good education free, and in return, they were good teachers, paid taxes, and were good citizens. God knows in her, you know, 30 years of teaching and everything else, and our 40 years of marriage, uh, and the children we produced, that was a good investment. The country got a return on that investment. Uh, in a solid, stable, family, community service, everything. Um, we don't get that anymore from people who are probably smarter than us because she, as soon as she got her master's, we left New York and came back to Atlanta and joined the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and. Uh, and so from 61 on to her death in 1994, her life was totally a life of service, where we didn't make any money, didn't care. We didn't need any. We had enough to build, you know. To, we paid $32,000 for this house <laughs> on two acres of land here in the middle of Atlanta. Uh, and we've been here ever since we got, you know, since then. Uh, now we added this room when uh, my mother came to live with us. 
Uh, but by that time, she was working with IBM uh, on a project with teaching children to read and write with computers. Um, and um, I'm just saying that nowadays, I performed a wedding about five years ago, and um, I started kidding the couple about not having any children, you know, after three years, two years. And they said, we can't afford to. I said, why? Um, between the two of them, they had $350,000 worth of student loan debt. Now, she had a Harvard Law degree. He had an MBA from the Maxwell School in Syracuse. So they were extremely well educated, the best that you could offer. But even they could not afford to have children, and they could not afford to start a business. They couldn't afford to give much volunteer service. And they finally ended up divorcing. Hmm. Um, and so bad economic policy is the root of, I think, all of the evils of this nation right now. Mm -hmm. But we tend not to talk about them, about the bad economic policy. We tend to talk about the color, the class, the um, party, the Democrat or Republican party, the deficit. Um, I mean, there was no deficit when everybody reported their money and paid their taxes. <laughs> you know, Jimmy Carter, I think, went into, went into presidency when the deficit was $61 billion. Uh, when he left four years later, it was $60 billion. <laughs> Now the deficit is up in the trillions of dollars. And the world is not as well off. Mm -hmm. So that the money that was being invested in people and the money that was being invested in mass transit and uh, uh, highways uh, and uh, all of the things that we did, the Urban Development Action Grants that helped us develop Atlanta, none of those things exist anymore. Hmm. Uh, and Atlanta was lucky, or we were both lucky and smart, uh, that we escaped that trap. And we can go back to that hmm. when you want to, but uh, it, uh, the race situation is all tied up in the problems of the world economy. And, uh, well, let's just go to, when I became mayor, I never forgot the fact that I was in that, uh, that banking committee meeting. And I read everything I could find about why they were doing this, and none of it made sense to me. until I got an iPad. <laughs> and people kept talking about John Maynard Keynes. I didn't know who that was. I mean, I'd heard it, but I typed in Keynes in my iPad and punched search. And what came up on my iPad was the economic consequences of peace in which Keynes was talking about why it was necessary to keep a stable economy uh, after a war, to stabilize it as quickly as possible so that there wouldn't be another war. Mm -hmm. And when I ended up, it's not a long piece, when I ended up, I realized it was written in 1913. And Keynes was trying to tell us how to prevent the First World War. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't listen to him. So we had the First World War, and we still didn't listen. 
and Hitler's inflation and the killing of six million Jews were all problems that were blamed on a bad economy. And they had to find a scapegoat. And, and we ended up going to war and 66 million people were killed in the Second World War before we came back and did what Keynes was talking about. And what Keynes was talking about in 1913 was what we finally did in 1944. And that was the Bretton Woods Agreements. Now in 1974, by 1973, 74, the Nixon crowd wanted to throw that out of the window. I still don't know why. If it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. <laughs> the world was going extremely well, and that decision put us on an economic roller coaster, and I would go so far as to say the reason for the destabilization the terrorism, the violence, the bloodshed, the extreme suffering, famine, and hardship that the world is suffering right now is a result of that bad decision, which we never have discussed. Hmm. We've never, we, we've never, I mean, when I try to discuss it with the economists, because I'm, I'm still trying to understand why we did that. I mean, they look at me like I'm crazy. Where did, where did you come from? Mm. You know? And of course, because I learned from it when I got to be mayor, I realized that there was no money in Washington. And there wasn't any money that Atlanta was going to get out of the state capitol in the gold dome and that if we were going to run a city, we had to find the finances abroad. So um, I remember the first time I said this in a meeting of bankers uh, that Charlie Loudermilk took me to, uh, one of the guys that became a good friend later on said, Charlie, where in the hell did that nut come from? <laughs> <laughs> what is a mayor doing talking about global economy? <laughs> and Atlanta being an international city. Well, I had, I had been in that economics meeting uh, in 1973. I had been to the UN with President Carter and traveled around the world from 77 um, to 80. Uh, and like Willie Sutton, why, they would say, why is he going all over the world. That's not the mayor's business. The mayor's supposed to be here. But almost every quarter, I went somewhere in the world where they had money. <laughs> <laughs> and I invited them to invest their money here. And uh, it didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen anywhere else in the country. But for instance, we invited the Dutch the Dutch Institutional Holding Company put almost a billion dollars into Atlanta my first term. They built two Ritz-Carlton's, uh, the one downtown, the one in Buckhead with the Monarch Plaza. Uh, they bought um, Phipps Plaza and expanded it, and they bought Perimeter Mall. Well, that's pretty good cash flow coming in and it didn't cost the city any, anything. We didn't have to pay any taxes. We gave them very few incentives. The only thing we guaranteed them was that their money would be safe, that we would be honest. They didn't have to pay anybody under the table, mm -hmm. and that we would be an efficient government that would help them complete their buildings and their investments on time and within budget. And the only thing we asked them to do was employ all of our citizens, black and white, male, female, gay, straight, young and old, uh, just be inclusive in your hiring, and they were very glad to do that. Uh, but the money just flowed in. 
And um, I, I remember fighting with, with Delta. I went to see Delta about us building a new international terminal because Maynard had just finished the ABCD concourse. Um, and I said, we need a, we had a plan for a T concourse. And I said, that could be the international concourse. And um, the airlines hired McKenzie to do a feasibility study that said we didn't need it. And I said, but we have to have it because, you know, that's where the money comes from. And I remember going to Germany and uh, discussing with Lufthansa moving into Atlanta. And I went to Japan and we got Japan Airlines to come in and we got Swiss Air. And KLM was already coming in, as was British Caledonia. So before they finished their study, saying we couldn't afford it, we didn't need it, we had enough airlines coming in to require us to build it. So we built it on a 24-hour schedule. And built it, still got it on time, so that when they wanted to come in, they could come in. Now, what does that mean? Lufthansa didn't believe that they had enough business to fly to Atlanta. And I said, well, and I, they suggested, maybe if we flew half freight and half passengers, we could make it. I said, would you please try I said, give us six months to see whether it'll work. They decided to come on in. Not only did it work, but by the time I left, 300 German companies had moved into Atlanta hmm. in the eight years after I made that visit. I went back, this is 2012, to a celebration at the German consulate, and I said, look, we used to have about 300 German companies here. How many do we have now? This is 2012, after the Olympics and everything else. He said, oh, we have well over 1,500. I said, no, I mean in the Atlanta area, not nationwide. He said, well, nationwide we have about 3,000. He said, but we have 1,500 in the metropolitan Atlanta area. Now that's where the money's coming from. When people see Atlanta grow from a million people to now 6.2 million. Um, that's not poor people with problems coming in. Uh, that's Porsche. <laughs> See, that's Volkswagen. That's 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 a Deutsche Bank, uh, and um, it was the same with Japan. There are over 500 Japanese companies operating here now. Uh, the Dutch um, sold their first investments after a couple of years for double what they put into it, and they moved their money ex elsewhere, but there's still a pretty good Dutch presence here as mm -hmm. well. And, and we found, because of this background, I mean, that's the reason we have been able to make Atlanta a success. Now, this was nothing that I planned. Um, this was all planned by the chamber, by Ivan Allen, uh, by Mayor Hartsfield. Atlanta has always had a vision. We never, we never could be sure how to pay for it. And what this, what I, was able to do because of my background at the UN and the Banking Committee um, was I was able to get people to trust Atlanta and bring their money and do their business here. Now Maynard Jackson solved most of the big problems. I didn't have a lot of problems to solve because he built the airport and that was a tough uh, sell. We had problems with race and the police. Uh, he, by the time I got here, he had a black police chief and a black public safety commissioner. Uh, I figured 
when the public safety commissioner left, um, I figured we needed to balance it racially. So uh, I brought in Morris Redding as a police chief, someone who knew Atlanta, white, had been, I think he'd been a part of the security uh, for Mayor uh, Hartsfield and Ivan Allen. So he knew the city. He had helped us lead uh, the regional approach to the problem of the missing and murdered children. So he got along well with all of the other surrounding areas, which is something we need now. Mm -hmm. um, he also was able to help us coordinate uh, the security issues uh, with the Olympics uh, in 1996, so that, that um, we had a good plan, a great vision, and the timing of my background with some of some places. Well, Jimmy Carter wanted me to go to to the UN because of my relationship to Martin Luther King, and I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay in Congress. I thought he needed help in Congress, um, and I wanted Congresswoman Barbara Jordan to go to the UN, and. He said, the only thing is, if we're going to be serious about this human rights business, we need somebody who was actually marching with Martin Luther King. So that's the reason I left the Congress and went to the UN. Mm -hmm. But I told him then, I said, you know, I can't, if I ever have to choose between the State Department policies and some of the ideals for which Martin Luther King gave his life, I said, I'm not going to choose the, state, choose the State Department, say. And he said, that's the reason I want you to go, because we need to push this human rights issue further. Well, I was frankly thinking about China and Vietnam uh, and South or Southern Africa. Palestinians never crossed my mind. <laughs> but we were able to do, we were able to work, well, Jimmy Carter um, gave me a little note, which I think was the key to peace and prosperity during his four years. We forget that nobody got killed in the four years Jimmy Carter was president in war, and no American killed anybody. And we had peace with Panama and the Panama Canal, we resolved the problems of Southern Africa, and um, everybody's talking about the lack of security uh, in our embassies. He sent me by myself, maybe with one or two people with me. <laughs> I mean, we we never had any, we we never had a security issue uh, be, because of one word. He wrote me a note saying, Andy, I want you to go to Africa and ask African leaders what they expect of this administration. Now, it's all the difference in the world with me going someplace telling somebody what we were going to do and me going with good Southern manners, mm -hmm. asking your opinion. But I think he did that with... Uh, Rosalind Carter, when she went to Latin America, uh, she wasn't going delivering any instructions. Uh, Cyrus Vance went to talk to the Russians, and Mondale went to talk to the uh, to the Japanese. Uh, Bob Strauss uh, went to talk to the Israelis and the Egyptians. And what we found was that almost everybody wanted us to help them do what they wanted to do. And they didn't know how to say it, and they couldn't do it on their own. But Egypt got, was upset that Israel had beaten them in the 74 war. And so they didn't want to go to war with Israel anymore. 
But Israel under Begin understood that it was probably lucky that they weren't going to beat, uh, that Egypt is so much bigger. Uh, and if the Russians got behind Egypt, they, they might not come out the same way before. So Egypt and Israel both wanted peace and didn't know how to get it. But when that message came back to President Carter, he forced them <laughs> by the sheer power of his will to sign a peace treaty. It's lasted over 40 years and it's still working, but people thought he was crazy. How is he gonna, you know, and both the Egyptians and the Israelis are mad at him, <laughs> though they would not be in existence if he had not done that. That would have been a terrible calamity had he not done that. We, we uh, Ronald Reagan gets the credit for de-escalating the, the um, problems with the Soviet Union, but it was Carter that broke down the, the barriers. And we negotiated the first arms limitation treaty. And I remember because the guest ambassadors on that occasion were Governor, former Governor Averill Harriman, who had been ambassador to Russia for many years, as well as Governor of New York, uh, Coretta Scott King, uh, Paul Newman, and Robert Redford. <laughs> and they were the negotiating team that worked with us on that treaty. And, um, you know, I, I remember one of the reasons I can't forget it is that the Russian ambassador's wife called me up and that was very unusual. And she said, Mr. Ambassador, I said, yes, Madam Tr Tronofsky, how can I help you? N no help. I thought you were my friend. I said, I am your friend. No, you're not my friend. Why, why, why am I not your friend? you're having Paul Newman to lunch and you did not invite me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, please come, please, please. She said, I said, well, this was an official function and normally the wives don't, are not invited. I said, my wife was not planning to be there. Uh, she said, but, uh, well, she said, I understand. I said, but no, you please come, come as my guest hell with protocol. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I will come under one condition. I said, what is that? That you sit me next to Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we, really, we really had a good experience with people because I, took, I approached, well, I approach everything like a preacher. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, that's basically what I am. So when when I went to the Civil Rights Movement, I thought we were like the Apostle Paul going from city to city, you know, preaching the gospel. Uh, when I went to the Congress, that was just like having a 435 member church. Uh, we had a Bible study every Wednesday morning and if people were sick, I went to visit the, you know, the congressman and I mean, I, I just approached it like a a pastor would, should approach a church. When I got to the UN, there were 166 member nations, and I made a personal call on each one of them, like I do with members of my church. But it, it was, uh, it created a completely different atmosphere. Uh, I never had a single veto from the Russians or the, the, or the Chinese. Um, at the UN. And it was basically because uh, we treated them like friends. Did you ever exercise a veto? I had to exercise a veto a couple of times. You did? Yeah. And I was very apologetic about it. In fact, the reason I was meeting with the Palestinians was that they were offering to recognize Israel 
they were offering to uh, adopt all of the UN resolutions pertaining to the Middle East. Um, and um, it was a resolution that they told me was written by Arafat himself. Well, the only problem was it was in the month of August, and that was the month that President Carter was shuffling his cabinet. And I was saying to them, this is not something the United States can do right now. I said, we can't even focus on this. Um, and I was pleading with them to let me put it off until January or February. And I said, then we can have time to deal with it. Um, they were willing to consider it, but in the meantime, well, the State Department uh, wanted me to say that I was not meeting with the Palestinians. And I said, but that's my job. You know, as the president of the Security Council, I have to meet with all parties of the dispute. I said, not only did I meet with the Palestinians, but as soon as I left the meeting, not only did I write a report of the meeting to the State Department, I wrote a report of the meeting to the Israeli ambassador because he knew before I went there that I was doing that. And I said, one of the things that I refused to do was uh, operate in secret. I said, the, the key to our success in the civil rights movement was that we were totally transparent. Um, well, even this house, this house was bugged from 1967 until we just found it just, uh, what is this, 2013, when we put up that fence out there. We found an extra wire <laughs> that was going to a house down the street. And uh, we figured, you know, we'd been, been bugged since 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't matter. And we wanted everybody to know what we were doing. And I, I didn't have any secret meetings at the, uh, at the UN. And I didn't meet in secret with people in Birmingham or Selma. Uh, we met, well, really in Birmingham, we met at the Episcopal Church, uh, at their diocesan house, uh, at the invitation of the bishop. Uh, and that's where we had the negotiation. So I always, the civil rights movement, people always thought we were worse than we were. They were afraid we were communists, they didn't know what, they were accusing us of trying to overthrow the government. And, what it really was, was white people were afraid that if we got power, we would treat them like they'd been <laughs> treating us. <laughs> and we, we were trying to make sure that, that this was, that this nonviolent social change started with forgiveness. And it started with, with understanding and, and a clean slate. Uh, and, um, but I think because we did that, that helped me do the same thing for President Carter with South Africa and Zimbabwe and Namibia. And, and even with the Panamanians. Uh, I had been down to Panama with some of my missionary friends when I was in Congress. And um, so I knew most of the people who we would be negotiating with. And I knew we could trust them, you know, to keep an agreement if we made it. Um, and um, it is, um, well, I, I've just lived a blessed life. And one thing led to the next. The, I'm not giving you a chance to ask me any questions, but <laughs> I don't need to. You're <laughs> but for instance, the Olympics, the Olympics came directly out of the United Nations, mm -hmm. and it wasn't my idea. Billy Payne got this crazy idea, um, and it was crazy only because 
Montreal was still $700 million in debt. And everybody assumed that if you have the Olympics, it, um, you end up in debt. And so even my staff, Shirley Franklin and, and Gene Duffy and others, did not want me to even meet with Billy Payne because they said, you uh, Olympic crazy, and he might convince you to try to go after the Olympics. Um, and so actually, we met at a restaurant. We didn't meet in the city hall. <laughs> and Horace Sibley and, and uh, Doug Gatlin and I had, had, had uh, lunch with Billy. And the difference was that Montreal did theirs with the government. And see, we don't do business with the government as much. We have what we call public purpose capitalism. We define the public purpose, but we don't pay for it. Then we get the capitalists with the money together, and we say, look, if you want to do this, this is a good deal that we support. You can put your money in, you can build it, you can manage it, you can make the money off of it, but we get what we need. And that's the way we built the airport. And the, the airport probably cost us somewhere around $10 billion. Uh, but in 2010, it made $52 billion that one year mm -hmm. and created almost 300,000 jobs. Now, that was an exceptional year. Last year, I think it was down to just $23 billion. But in 2010, see, we built that, we added that railroad mm -hmm. to the convention and the new convention center uh, down on Camp Creek. and. All of that, you know, mm -hmm. really built up the economy. But um, that airport pays for itself and makes money for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no taxpayer money in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Billy got his idea after having a heart attack. I mean, he was a very young man, been a football player at Georgia, uh, but had a heart attack at 34. And his father had died before he was 50 of a heart condition. So uh, I figure that's the way God gets your attention. Because <laughs> he got involved after that heart attack while he was recovering. He got involved with his church. He raised money to build a new sanctuary for the Dunwoody Presbyterian Church. And he said that for the first time in his life, he felt like really good about himself. See? And, and more, this was the most significant thing he'd ever done. And he said to his wife, Martha, I just hope I can find one more thing that I could do that would make me feel like I had made a real contribution to life before I die. And then he goes home and he sits down and uh, the 17 Days of Glory is on television talking about the Olympics. And he gets the idea, could we bring the Olympics to Atlanta? Well, now, for most folks, that wouldn't make sense. But for me, a preacher in me says, if you get a heart attack, God's got your attention. <laughs> <laughs> and if he sends you to church to build a new sanctuary and you do it, and you come out wanting to do something else worthwhile, and the Olympics pops into your head, that's the way the Holy Spirit works for me. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, that's like um, the Bible says, reading the handwriting on the wall, the signs of the times. And so as far as I was concerned, that was a message that God was sign trying to send to us. And I know mm -hmm. that sounds crazy, but then the other religious person on my staff, uh, Maggie Womack, who was really a very devout Christian, gave me this little book, which was the list of all of the, uh, the countries that voted. And there were 85 people on the list, 
72 countries. And I started counting where I knew people, or knew people who knew people, or where I thought we could, what, how many votes could we get? And I counted 55 votes right off the bat that I said, I know somebody who knows somebody if I don't know them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we can get 55 of these 85 votes. So as far as I was concerned, the only problem we had was how to pay for it. And I said, now, I will work with you but I won't work as mayor because I don't want this to be a government project. If we can form a nonprofit uh, corporation in 1998, put on the Olympics, shut it down in 1998, um, we could probably run this like a nonprofit business and, um, and make it work. Well, nobody thought we had a chance, so we went to all the hotels and we said, look, we don't want you ripping off people. Uh, will you sign to keep the same you know, convention rates that you have in 1994 and 1996? They didn't think we had a chance to get it, so everybody agreed to everything we asked them. The labor union said, sure, you give us, you're bringing this much work in, uh, we'll promise not to strike. Uh, and everybody just, uh, Alta uh, put up, they agreed to contribute, add $10 a person to their membership. The Peachtree Road Race added $10 a person to their road race. Uh, uh, and uh, everybody just chipped in. Um, Nations Bank was brand new. And the day we won, Hugh McCall walked in the office and said, well, I had written him a note saying, now that you've acquired our biggest bank, mm -hmm. uh, don't stay up there in Charlotte, you know, and treat us like we're sharecroppers. Come on down here in Atlanta and get involved. We need your help with the colleges, with the Olympics. Uh, and we need you to build some downtown housing in Atlanta like you've done in Charlotte. Well, he was being sued by the NAACP, not wanting him to come, so somebody writing him a note wanting him to come. Uh, he came by to see us. The day we got back from uh, uh, Tokyo, we won the Olympics, but when you win the Olympics, they give you a letter saying you won the Olympics. The, 19, the Centennial Olympic Games, congratulations. Oh, by the way, you owe a million and a half dollars for the victory party. <laughs> <laughs> the winner has to pay for the last party. Well, we were broke. We didn't raise but six million dollars to, to, to go after the games. Uh, and so uh, Hugh McCall walking in uh, and offering help uh, we said, could you be the first sponsor? And he said, that would be wonderful. I'd be honored to be the first sponsor for the Olympic Games. And I couldn't fix my mouth to say how much it cost. Because <laughs> um, it was, we were asking $40 million for the lead sponsor. And I, I, I'm not used to asking people for that kind of money. <laughs> but uh, Charlie Battle and Billy Payne and all said, well, they explained it and gave him the figure, and he said, okay, I can handle that. He said, we just spent $90 million changing the name on this bank. The <laughs> Olympics will probably, you know, for $40 million, sounds like a good deal. And then when he was so enthusiastic, I said, but uh, Mr. McCall, the key to the success of these games is going to be, can we do it like a private business and not have to go to the city, the state, the counties to get money? And I said, we think we can raise the money, but to get started on everything right now and have everything ready on time, we need a line of credit. And he said, well, how much do you need? I said, well, we need at least $300 million. <laughs> And I said, we don't expect you to give it to us, but 
if you could guarantee, if you could get the other banks to guarantee it, and um, that would let us start letting contracts. And he said, "Well, I'll I'll give them see what the boys have to say." He said, "But if if they won't do it, you can count on me to." And fortunately, we didn't need it because. Um, European television uh, called us up. They had heard that uh, Berlusconi down in Italy was planning to offer us $300 million for the television rights. And they had paid only $30 million uh, to Los Angeles. And uh, so we had made it plain that the only way we were going to be able to make this work was that television was going to really have to carry the ball. So somebody from England, I mean from the, the British, well it, it was the European uh, public television channel, called up and said, would you all accept $270 million cash up front in exchange for the rights? We said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they put the money in the bank and that we didn't have to call on the banks for the guarantee. And it was smooth sailing right on then. And instead of, I thought it was gonna be about a half a billion dollars to put on the Olympics. It ended up being two and a half billion. Mm -hmm. But we didn't spend but 2.4 billion. We had almost a hundred million dollars left over all the debts were paid. We built everything on time. We gave the everybody that gave us land to use. Uh, we gave Georgia Tech and Georgia State the the dormitories from the uh, but um, the Olympic Village and everybody got a stadium. Uh, we gave the Braves that stadium, which they now don't seem to want. Uh, but um, it, 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 it just worked out like it was uh, meant to be. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget your race for governor in 1990. No, let's forget it. <laughs> I thought you did a masterful job in that campaign. Well, I tell you, I, I called Zell Miller about a month ago. He told me yesterday and said mm -hmm. to tell you that that really meant a lot to him. Well. And he appreciated it. Yeah. It meant a lot to me to, uh, you know, I, 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 know, I didn't want to run for Congress and I didn't want to run for mayor. And I was doing it because I felt that I had some duty to do it. And then I, I, I thought I could win for Congress and I, I, I really knew I could win as mayor. But I didn't have any that kind of confidence about the governor's race. But I figured if everybody else wanted me to run, um, and I'm glad I ran because one of the things that gave me and Zell a chance to agree on, I didn't like the lottery, and he was with the lottery. But he believes in education. I mean, he really is the you know the, a, a man who understands how important an education is to do anything, and um, he and I agreed that whoever won all of the funds for the lottery would go only to the Hope Scholarship Trust Fund where it could only be spent on higher education and preschool. And the thing is, if I had won the governor's race, I couldn't have gotten the state legislature to do that. See? But he could. Mm -hmm. So I got what I think I wanted or what the state needed Mm -hmm. out of that race, and he got to be governor, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was a good one.
Mm -hmm. And I think that the thing that makes Georgia competitive with almost everybody in the world right now is the network of colleges and uh, the metropolitan colleges, the uh, technical colleges, uh, the university system. I mean, we can hold our own with anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got a bucket list? Yeah. What's on it? Unfinished work. And I, I, I hate to talk about it because it sounds crazy, but all this stuff was crazy. I mean, it was crazy. If I had told Martin Luther King in 1965 that I wanted to be congressman, he would have set me down under a shade tree and poured a bucket of water on me <laughs> and tell me I was out of my mind, that I needed to come to my senses. Uh, but my bucket list is in that same way. I still worry about the people on these farms who really were the ones who fought the civil rights battles. Now the college kids got into these colleges and they got into these corporations, but the people who did the marching and the people who went to jail and the people who caught the hell are still scattered around across the South and they are still hurting economically and they're getting older. Um, and I found something uh, called duckweed. I don't know whether you know a duckweed mm -hmm. slime, that mm -hmm. green slime that right. grows on just about everybody's pond in the right. south. Right. Well, I found some young fellows who have figured out how to turn that into ethanol, but also into a protein for animal food. And with what's left, um, they can generate electricity. And they have figured out how to fertilize it very inexpensively so that it grows two or three times as fast. So that we could harvest the duckweed off a pond uh, once or twice a week mm -hmm. and get $60 a ton for it. Think you can do that with kudzu? We haven't figured out how to do it with kudzu yet. <laughs> but kudzu's on my list. But <laughs> the duckweed we're ready for. And because it, it, it's a perfect system, it's a closed loop system, that the duckweed also has a natural growth hormone in it. So that if you put catfish or tilapia or freshwater trout under it, uh, they grow faster. Mm. And so down in Louisiana where we're testing this, uh, they grow three pound catfish, you know, in five or six weeks. Uh, so you got energy, you've got food, you've got animal food, and you've got a high level protein. Now, we think, we're, we've been trying to get uh, some people to back this. I don't want to sell this. I want to give this the 2,300 farmers that we organized back in 65 with a fellow by the name of Randolph Blackwell. And they're still pretty much meeting. And we'd like to start with those 2,300. And they, my age, which means they can't ride a tractor for six, eight hours in the sun anymore. But this is something you can skim the duckweed off a pond uh, in an hour, you know, every afternoon and have a cash crop mm -hmm. twice a week. Uh, President Carter has a 10 acre lake. So we said, you know, we put some of that duckweed on <laughs> his 10, 10 acre pond. Um, you can get $60 a ton and you can get one ton per acre every time you harvest it. So, you know, that, that's... Uh, Let, let's talk for a minute, if you will, about your relationship with Jimmy Carter. He, he has said repeatedly that he became president of the United States 
because of Andrew Young? Well, uh, <laughs> I remember Bob Steed. <laughs> Bob Steed introduced me one time after Jimmy Carter had lost as the man who was most responsible <laughs> for Jimmy Carter being where he is today. <laughs> but we, 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 we were, you know, he's a person I trust and he's one of the smartest and the most disciplined person I've ever known. Um, and I love him like a brother or a father, uh, but it's hard for us to be friends, uh, mainly because he is so organized and so different, dif dif disciplined, and I am such a wild, free spirit. You know, uh, uh, me and Billy could get along great. <laughs> uh, Billy and I had a good time whenever we got together. But President Carter is very, he, he's, he reminds me of the, the, the meeting, the, the, the little poem that Dr. Mays taught Martin Luther King. It's a tiny little minute, just 60 seconds in it. I didn't choose it, I can't abuse it, it's up to me to use it. It's a tiny little minute, just 60 seconds in it, but eternity is in it. And Jimmy Carter values every minute, every second. And I, that's a little too rigid for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but anyway, we, we work together very well. But we don't work together. I mean, I campaigned in 41 states for him, but I don't think Anybody in the campaign knew it. And the reason was that I thought the Congress was the key to his mm -hmm. presidency. And everybody in the Congress was coming up asking me to explain why I'm supporting this Georgia cracker. <laughs> and I had to explain. They, and they asked me would I come out to their districts and explain. See? So I never, the only trip I took I took a trip with uh, Tim uh, Kraft. No, um, oh, God, yeah. he's gonna. But anyway, my my senior. My, I went to California with him once to a fundraiser that was sponsored by friends of mine that wanted me to come. And I went to uh, uh, Boston, Cambridge, uh, to introduce him because friends of mine asked me to come. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, that, that bothers me. It's like forgetting one of my. Children's Tim. name. Tim. Two final quick questions. Mm -hmm. We live in a very troubled world. You know that better than anybody. What must we do to regain, regain our position and status in this world? Well, that's another long hour lecture, but <laughs> <laughs> let me give you the short version, I think is I don't think we're in trouble. I think we're, I think we're in the middle of a mess that's the most creative mess humanity has ever created. I mean, we can wire money all around the world with a cell phone. Uh, we can transfer technology. I remind people that in 1540, they invented the printing press. And we didn't stabilize the world for another 400 years. Just the printing press, when they translated the Bible to German, you had 100 years of war in Europe. 
Then it was translated to English, and the Anglican Church ended up producing the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the Congregationalists. And they all had to get out of England, so they came here and founded America. Uh, all that was because of the printing press, mm -hmm. see? And if you figure, if it takes the world 400 years to deal with that level of technology, it's going to take the rest of everybody's life uh, to assimilate the technology that we now have because we're producing it so fast we can't even understand it. I mean, I got stuff that by now, my, I gave my one-year-old grandson an iPad, and he's two, and it's like his favorite toy. He can do anything. I mean, he can play games. He can look up stuff. He can, I mean, you know, for him, it won't be a problem. It's a problem for me. I just can't make a phone call. <laughs> I can read a book on an iPad. But the present generation of young people who is growing up with this t technology, like, it was never any problem for me with a bicycle or a car. I fixed cars, and I could fix my bicycles and roller skates. I mean, because I grew up with that. It was natural. Nobody had to teach me. See, I think when I look at my grandchildren, that's the way they are with today's technology. They're very comfortable with it. Uh, they happen to be a mixed language family. So uh, they, 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 you know, the mama's Spanish, and, and uh, so they're bilingual to start with. And my son is making sure that they're going to read and write in at least two languages. And as soon as they get comfortable in those, he's going to push them to learn two more. You know, so I'd say that, that kids who are growing up today will take charge of this world and do as good, if not better, job. Now, all of the ingredients are there, and even you and I could figure it out <laughs> so if, without computers. <laughs> if we just put everything together like they taught us in Sunday school, right. there is somewhere between 20 and 40 trillion dollars that's in tax havens, you know, that's not being spent. That was the money I went looking for when I was mayor. It wasn't but about a half a trillion then. But I went everywhere they were, I call it scared money. And I, I just had to convince them that Atlanta was safe and they could make more money putting their money in Atlanta than they could keeping it in Swiss banks or Dutch banks or German banks or Japanese banks. I was, well, next, this Friday, Saturday, the, the president is having 47 African presidents to come to Washington. And um, they're honoring me for something Monday night or something like that. Um, but, and I just got back from Congo, Brazzaville. Uh, all we hear about is the Ebola, the disease. But the wealth that is present in Africa, the technology that is possessed around the world, if we can put it together we can solve all of the problems of the planet in a decade. And there's a young man who I met about 20 years ago who um, kind of almost has that as his vision. He runs, he, he runs a cellular network in 17 African countries, three Latin American countries, New Zealand, and he just bought a company up in Vermont. And he's maybe 55 years old. But he's, 
he's as devout, if not more devout, a Christian than Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and he gives 2% of all the wealth of his country, of his companies, to take care of the poor. And so he's taking care of 45,000 orphans in these countries where he works. And he's sending them to college. He's got about 300 of them in colleges in Africa. He sent 30 to Atlanta. Uh, there are 20 at Morehouse and 10 at Spelman. And he's going to send uh, 10 more every year until, because he wants the next generation of leaders in his companies to have the kind of experience with free enterprise, democracy, and race relations that he has seen here in Atlanta. And he wants them to go to school here in Atlanta. And I, I see signs like that that I think the world's in pretty good hands. And people are not stupid. They really aren't. They act stupid, but they're not stupid. Uh, let me just say the, the Olympics is a good example. Uh, I said if we're going to have the Olympics, we've got at least 40% of the money we raise and spend has got to be spent with minority-owned companies or female-owned companies, because they have been locked out of the economy. Well, people said, well, why are you going to give them silver? I, mean, and I said, wait a minute. I said, if we get the Olympics, we'll have a billion dollars, and minorities and women will get 400 million, and you'll get 600 million. See? I said, but if the Olympics comes here, there's going to be another $10 billion that'll have nothing to do with the Olympics. And you get 90, 85, 90% of that. So, now I said, we can fight about this 40%, and you lose 90% of $10 billion. So, or we can work together on this 40%, and you can get your 90% and everybody will be happy. Well, I mean... That's not race, that's <laughs> good common sense, see? And that's the way the world works. And, and if we can get people to take the long haul and to realize, as Dr. King used to say, we either will learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we'll perish together as fools. There's, there's, there's no halfway. And I think this country gives, I mean, I've been so impressed with young people I meet, see? and even old people. I mean, that, that um, when, when I look at, at the people who led us through the Civil Rights Movement, I mean, Ivan Allen started out a segregationist. Uh, he ended up being the only mayor to go to Washington to testify on behalf of the Civil Rights Act. That's a tremendous amount of transformation and change, see? Mm -hmm. And that's been true of almost everybody here. Now, our problem in Atlanta and Georgia is that we went through this fight nonviolently in the 60s and 70s. We, uh, put the gravy on it and made, made it really fixed up good with the Olympics and things in the 90s. See? But all of that was working together as brothers and sisters. Now we got a bunch of people that have come here since 2000 and they don't know how we got like this. And they are sitting around, some of them are running companies that don't know how those companies got built. Some of them are on the television or right in the news media, and they don't have, I mean, it, 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 it amazes me how little sense of history that modern day news media have. It's, it's not about facts, and it's, it's about, you know, ratings. Uh, but we had a Ralph McGill uh, writing down the corner of the page 
down on the left-hand side of the page every day. I think he wrote something like 11,000 columns. Mm -hmm. um, something like that, somebody like that has to emerge to help us through. And we have a few people. Um, but um, we still have people who Who are afraid? They're afraid of the future. And the only thing I have to say to them is something I heard as a boy from Franklin Roosevelt. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Well said.